Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IWH Speaker Series for February the 8th, 2022. My name is Peter Smith. I'm a member of the scientific staff here at the Institute for Work and Health, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Emil Tompa, who is a senior scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. He is also the director of the Center for Research on Work Disability Policy. Um, Emil, in addition to those roles, holds academic appointments both at McMaster Uni University in the Department of Economics and at the University of Toronto in the Dalalana School of Public Health. Emil today will be talking to us about the development and implementation of a framework for estimating the economic benefits of having an accessible and inclusive society. For those of you who might have questions uh, during the presentation or after the presentation, if you could pop them into the chat box and then at the end of the presentation, I will ask your questions to Emil and he will answer them uh, at that time. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Emil, and I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Super. Well, well, thank you much, very much for that introduction, Peter, and thank you all for joining us for this session. Um, before I begin, I wanted to note that this study is a team effort undertaken by myself and my colleagues who are listed on this slide. And so I want to acknowledge the important contributions that each of these people have made to to the creation of, of, of this study and its analysis. Um, particularly, I want to give a shout out to Amir Mofidi, who is a key numbers person behind a lot of the, um, the information you'll be seeing in the next few slides. Um, I want to note that this, uh, this is a published study. Um, it's an open access study, so it's available to anyone. So the, the citation is at the bottom of this slide. I'm also going to be providing a link to it and the full of report, which is available on our CRWDP website on the last slide. And I believe Sabrina will be putting um, the information for the citations in the chat box as well. So um, this is just giving you an overview of what I'll be covering in this session. I will only be able to give a high level overview of the methods and findings given the complexity of this study and given also that I'm gonna to try to keep this presentation to 30 minutes or so, so that we have a good amount of time for questions and discussion after the presentation. But if we don't get to your questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me afterwards um, by email. I've listed my email on the last slide for those of you who wanna contact me afterwards if you have any incremental questions or issues you'd like to discuss about this study. So in, in, in terms of the overview, I'll be giving you a, a high level overview of the research question and the context that, in which it's set. Um, I'm gonna drill down on, on only three areas of, of the analysis to give you a bit of insights into the computations that underline much of, much of the study, but I really can't cover it all. I'll really then, I'll also then move on to the applications of this methodology and estimates in different types of contexts. So some of the use scenarios of this kind of information. And then with the last few minutes I have, um, I will also give a preview of a new um, inclusive design for employment access or ideas social innovation laboratory that I've started up with Rebecca Gubert and a number of colleagues across Canada and internationally, as well as a number of partner organizations. And that's just been launched this semester, actually in January. So it could be a little bit of overview, including a small video about the initiative. And then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. So the key question we address in this study is what would be the benefits to Canadian society in reference year 2017 if Canada was accessible and inclusive in all domains relevant to full participation of persons with disabilities? Um, I have this gold bar at the bottom of the slide because the answer to this question is meant to serve as a gold standard. It quantifies the potential that could be realized if we were fully inclusive and accessible as a society. Um, in this slide, the table provides an overview of the size of the population of persons with disabilities. And as you can see, it's a sizable proportion of the Canadian population at 22% for persons 15 years of age and over. Um, so it's a quite a large fraction of our society. Um, now, persons with disabilities represent very diverse and varied life situations, but a common thread is that despite the progress we've made as a society to date, many still face discrimination and other barriers to full participation in various facets of our society. In our work, we attempt to include the benefits associated with the various social roles such as employment, education, community involvement, leisure, and other areas of our society. 
Um, there's also many spillover effects of inclusion for society at large, which we've tried to capture in our analysis. So we've tried to be as comprehensive as possible in terms of the direct, indirect, and intangible, intangible benefits that would be realized if we were fully accessible and inclusive as a Canadian society. So what we are ultimately estimating is what I would describe as the economic benefit to be realized if all barriers to full inclusion were removed. So we seek to measure that gap between our situation today in Canada and the ideal or counterfactual scenario where there, where there are no barriers to full participation for persons with disabilities. Um, this can provide invaluable information for policymakers, disability advocates, and industry leaders. And I, I try to give some use scenarios in the, in the last slide before um, we move on to the presentation of our social innovation laboratory to give a sense of where this data can be used to make various policy decision-making um, um, contexts where it can be used for that kind of purpose. Um, and I, so I'll be speaking more to those scenarios and then how that methodology can be used to, to inform those um, decisions that have to be made to help advance um, our society towards a more fully inclusive and accessible society. So in terms of the measurement context and challenges that we faced putting together this um, analysis, um, we started off with um, the, the context of um, the economic burden type studies, um, which is a broad literature that is um, quite um, established in, in the area of identifying the economic costs of injury and illness of various sorts in, in different kinds of contexts. Um, so we drew on this methodology, um, it's sometimes described as um, cost of illness type studies, but we took a very different framing. Um, our counterfactual scenario was the absence of barriers to inclusion, whereas um, the economic burden studies that we see traditionally in the literature are looking at the absence of injury and illness. So in this case, we are looking at the absence of barriers to inclusion. Um, we had to develop obviously a conceptual framework and methodology before implementing it, since we did not find any one study that took a comprehensive approach of the sort that we um, took for this study. Um, so um, to start off, we undertook an extensive literature review and key informant interviews to develop the framework and methodology. Um, we attempted to be um, as comprehensive as possible in identifying the set of domains that were reasonably mutually exclusive and for which we could measure the distinct benefits under each of those domains. And so we have listed here the 14 domains that are the underlying framework for our analysis. I've highlighted three um, that are um, um, ones that I'm going to be drilling down a little bit on in the next few slides to give you a sense of some of the computations we undertook to estimate the burden in, in each of these three domains. Um, some of the pieces of the puzzle were found in various literature, so it wasn't a, a, a one um, methodology that, that we had found some, that someone had already developed. We had to develop the methodology on our own using pieces of the puzzle that we found in various literatures to both identify the, the, those 14 domains and then find ways to quantify and monetize them so that we could come up with an overall estimate of, of the potential gains to be realized by a fully accessible and inclusive society. So here is another representation of our framework. There's a lot of detail, fine print there. I'm not expecting people to be able to, 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 to um, read those, those details, but it gives you a sense of, of, of the complexity of these honeycomb kind of domains that we, we had to compute um, the benefits to be realized if people were fully accessible, inclusive, if these domains were fully accessible and inclusive in that optimal counterfactual scenario. As I mentioned, I'm going to drill down on three areas, output and productivity. That's essentially the employment side. Um, we're going to look at um, administration of social safety net programs um, uh, with the assumption that there would be lower dependencies on these social safety net programs and there'd be some gains to be realized by having less dependency on, on transfer payments from these programs. And then we're also going to drill down on quality of life and social role participation gains to be realized. So um, in this slide, um, we're looking at output and pro productivity, essentially um, the, the gains to be realized if more people uh, who are per persons with disabilities would be actively engaged in, in paid labor market opportunities. Um, so we described as output and pro productivity gains. Um, there's a lot of detail in this slide. Um, um, this is the only math equation I'll give you in the whole presentation, so, so don't despair. I've tried to give um, a, a kind of a 
description of it at the very top in red. So what we're looking at is the, the loss or potential gain to be realized if persons with disabilities were actively engaged in the labor market to the same extent as people without disabilities. And that's composed of three components. There's an earnings gap for persons who are already employed in the labor market, but are earning lower um, or, um, amount of money because of the fact that they are not fully engaged as to the degree that they could be. Then there's an employment gap because fewer people who are in the labor market who are persons with disabilities are employed. And then there's a participation gap because there's fewer um, persons with disabilities actively engaged in the labor market compared to their non-disabled counterparts. And those three gaps, the earnings gap, the employment gap, and the participation gap together add up to the potential gains to be realized. In our counterfactual scenario, we level up earnings of persons with disabilities with that of their non-disabled peers to estimate that potential that would be realized if they were fully engaged in labor market activities to the same degree as non-disabled persons. So um, the next one is the domain of quality of life and social role engagement. We use a construct called quality adjusted life years or qualities as a measure of the of the gains to be realized by being fully engaged in various social domains in Canadian society. It's um, um, operationalized using the Health Utilities Index, or HUI. Um, that, this um, construct has been developed in the health economics literature. It's not the ideal um, measure that I would have liked to have used for quality of life, but it is the one that's very fully developed in, in the economics literature and is readily available in different surveys. And the data we took or this um, computation is from the Canadian Community Health Survey from 2014. We put a value of $100,000 on a quality based on the precedence that's available in the healthcare services literature. It's a common price tag put for the value of having a full year of perfect health or a full year in terms of quality adjusted life year. Um, and so that is sort of price point that's sort of the mid range in the ranges that we see in the literature. Again, we level up quality of life to that of persons without disability to identify the counterfactual scenario. Um, the last one I want to drill down on is the domain of administration of social safety net programs. Um, for this, we're really focusing on the reduced dependency on social safety net transfers, and we consider only the administration cost of the program. We are not considering the actual transfer payments because those transfer payments are not really considered gains to society, but just not, no, there's no need to reallocate those resources for persons who are fully engaged in paid labor market activities and don't require the dependence on those social transfers. So the real gain here is the administration of those programs. And so we're, we're assuming that the dependence on these programs will be cut in half. And that's a somewhat of a random assumption. We're thinking of if, if we could reduce that dependency by 50%, we um, actually gain a lot in terms of reduced um, social safety net program um, administration costs. The data we used for this study is, is the, developed by John Stapleton at the Metcalf Foundation. And the data is from 2015. And as you can see, we have a number of different social safety net programs um, that are available for persons with disabilities. And the estimates that you see in the right column are the percentages that have been traditionally used for um, proxying for the administration of these types of programs. The highest one, as you can see, is workers' compensation, which is uh, we use a 25% administration cost. That is common value used. Workers' compensation is a little bit more um, complex in its administration requirements, and so the administration costs are usually a bit higher than other social safety net programs. So um, here is our, our final summary measures. We've collapsed the 14 domains into five higher level categories where we have lower healthcare expenses, the output and productivity gains, which is the labor market participation gains to be realized, the quality of life and social role engagement. The spillover effects are the gains to larger society from having a more fully inclusive and accessible society. And then the market multiplier effects are the values gained by having persons with disability having higher incomes and being more active consumers in terms of purchasing of goods and services in the labor market. And there's multiplier effects that creates jobs for a lot of people when there's higher consumption ability amongst the constituents in a particular society. So that multiplier effect is something we've taken from the literature. The total benefit that has been realized from this fully accessible inclusive society for Canada in reference here 2017 is 338 billion dollars sizable amount that's 17.6 percent of GDP and that is 
for 2017 year alone. So we would realize this value in each year if we were accessible, fully accessible and inclusive in, in Canadian society. So this is a one year gain to be realized. Um, the quality, the output and productivity gains are quite sizable at 62.2 billion dollars or 3.2 percent of GDP and the quality of life benefits which is the largest component of these benefits is 132.2 billion dollars or 6.9 percent of GDP so quite a sizable gain to be realized in this slide we present the domains that we identified in our original framework um, listed um, in what's described as a tornado diagram where we show um, the breakdown by domain in blue bars identified by their relative monetary magnitudes listed from the smallest magnitude at the top to the largest magnitude at the bottom. So the quality of life and social role participation is the largest magnitude. The human rights one is, is, is small because it's primarily just reduced administration costs at the human rights tribunal because fewer cases will be going to the human rights tribunal for adjudication. Um, and so we see um, that um, the, the quality of life um, provides is 39.1% of the total benefit of $338 billion that we identified. Output and productivity and informal caregiving um, costs were the next um, largest magnitude and then the market multiplier effect, the, the next one at 14%. So we're looking at contributions of to that total benefit of 39% from quality of life and social role engagement, 17% for output and productivity, 17% of formal caregiving, and 14% for market multiplier effects. And then the others peter out to smaller amounts from there. So another computation we did, and I don't think this is available in the, um, the published report, but is available in the full report, is we estimated the public sector revenues that would be realized. I think this is really valuable information to for, for particularly policymakers who, who have a lot to gain by having a fully accessible inclusive society because there would be lower um, expenditures on transfer payments, um, increased revenue from taxes, both um, sales taxes and, and, and income taxes as well as other um, transfer payments to healthcare expenses that would be lower as well. So we've tried to compute those gains for the public sector at both the federal and provincial and territorial level. Um, so um, this really provides an important information for the leeway the governments um, would have having more um, resources to pursue new initiatives. Um, the income, they, as you can see, the composite here is for the federal level at $27.9 billion and for the provincial and territory level at $33.1 billion. So quite a bit of leeway that would be realized by governments in savings and, and transfer payments and reduced administration costs that would allow for opportunities to pursue other initiatives or, or contribute to the advancement of inclusion and accessibility in Canadian society in different ways. So in terms of application of this methodology and estimates, um, uh, the benefits of inclusion that we've calculated here are the benefit side of cost benefit analysis. Um, this study can be used for this purpose to do cost benefit analysis and was used to inform the impact analysis or what's a cost benefit analysis essentially of Accessible Canada Act. So it was used to do that estimate of that impact analysis for Accessible Canada Act. Another study we did on occupational lung cancer and mesothelioma burden was also used for this purpose to assess the impact of legislation banning the use of asbestos products. The per case benefits from such studies can also be used to evaluate existing or proposed initiatives. For example, this is something we're actually considering doing, evaluating the cost benefit potential of implementing a national disability insurance scheme, such as the one we see in Australia. Um, we used the occupational lung cancer study to evaluate also the cost benefit of best practices for exposure reduction in the construction sector in Ontario over a 30 year time period. Another study we did of a similar sort for EU OSHA on the burden of work injury and illness, which we piloted for five EU countries, Finland, Italy, Germany, Poland, and the Netherlands, is being rolled out now across Europe for within country comparisons over time to see how countries are doing over time to see if they're reducing the burden of work injury and illness and also for cross-country comparisons at a point in time to see what countries are doing better or worse and why. Stratification by sector, age bracket or sex also helps identify distributional issues of concern across different subsets of the population. Um, we also use the present study's findings to make the case for the high impact potential of the social innovation laboratory I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to do a little promo of that initiative in my last few slides and also have a short video to share with you.
So and it's called Ideas, Inclusive Design for Employment Access, and it's a social innovation laboratory. And um, what we frame this as is that uh, in the past, a lot of effort um, in the labor market, um, the efforts to include persons with disabilities in, in, in the labor market, was really focused on what we described as supply side interventions, where we're skilling up workers to be job ready and you know, responsiveness to individual accessibility needs. Um, yet, unfortunately, their engagement in the labor market has really remained substantially lower than persons without disabilities. And we felt that there was a need for scaling up employers' abilities to be more accessible and inclusive, something we describe as demand-side capacity building. Um, demand is, side is the term comes from the fact that employers demand labor, so they're the demand side and the um, persons with disabilities are on the supply side supplying their labor. So um, there's obviously significant human potential given that 22% of Canadians identify as persons with disabilities and that output um, um, productivity potential gap that we found of 3.2% of GDP and that larger potential benefit across all social areas of 17% of GDP that also could be captured by more active involvement of persons in, in remunerative meaningful employment opportunities. So I'll now turn to our Oh, sorry, here's a slide with all of our partners um, um, that are involved in this initiative. Um, there's a lot, number of academic and research institutions, disability communities, labor, industry, service, and government partners. So our partners will be working obviously very closely with us to make effective evidence-informed um, decisions in terms of how to advance inclusiveness in employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. And this is a six-year initiative that has been funded by the New Frontiers um, for Research. Um, fund um, that is a new envelope that just came out a, a couple of years ago and we just were awarded this um, funding envelope starting um, in January of this year so we're just launching the social innovation laboratory this semester so I'll turn now to our, our video so let me just see if I can hello my name is Tammy Yates and I am the executive director of Realize I am absolutely delighted to be sitting on the stakeholder advisory committee I look forward to the great work that we are all going to do together. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Kwan from the Canadian Labour Congress that represents the three million unionized workers in Canada. The post-pandemic recovery must include persons with disabilities, especially those with intersecting inequalities such as Indigenous, racialized and women workers. That's why Labour fully supports the Inclusive Design for Employment Access proposal. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce is the voice of Canadian business, representing 200,000 businesses across the country. We are focused on an inclusive recovery. We would be delighted to serve on Ideas Advisory Council and help identify practical solutions and amplify best practices. I'm Bruce Bonnyhuddy and I'm the inaugural director of the Melbourne Disability Institute at the University of Melbourne. Prior to joining the university, I was chair of Australia's National Disability Insurance Scheme. I'm also the parent of three adult sons, two of whom have disabilities. And my name is Michael McDonald. Um, I'm the manager of the health services department at Jazz Aviation, a regional airline in Canada. So my role is twofold, right? Because as a person with a disability, um, I'm going to make sure that uh, I'm out there sharing the lived experience perspective. Um, but I'm also very, very aware of the context in which the employment is going to happen. I just graduated from high school. I'm in um, short latex. My job is um, um, cleaning stuff like sanitizing, earthy cans, and in the garden center. So um, the, here's the citations for, for the two studies um, with links, um, and, and also Sabrina will be sharing it in the chat function as well. So now we can open it up for, for questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Emil. Um, we do have a, a few questions in the in the chat box. As, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, if people do have questions that they'd like to ask, if you could please um, put them in the chat box and I'll be able to read them out to Emil. There's a couple of questions which are quite specific to some of the methods, Emil, that you presented at the start of the presentation. So I might start with those. Um, what is about the $100,000 healthcare equivalent figure? Um, if you could provide some more details about, about how that estimate was, was made. Yeah, that's a good question. And so um, 
it's a judgment call of looking at the literature and thinking about the range of values you see in the literature. It, you know, there is there is a range. Um, in, the, the lower ranges are around $50,000. That was used in the 1990s in health technology assessment studies here in Canada. At the higher end, um, willingness to pay studies, when you ask people the value they place on, on, on a year in perfect health, it ranges around um, about $180,000, $190,000. Um, so the $100,000 is sort of in that middle range between the fifty dollars to $200,000 range. There's another literature called, um, it's called contingent valuation literature, the statistical value of a human life, where they actually look at people's behaviors, the risk-taking behaviors they take you know, in different sectors, um, in, in maybe high-risk type jobs, and the, in the values that they get in terms of incremental pay for taking on that risk. And those values um, are used to identify the statistical value of a human life. Those values are much, much larger. They're in the millions of dollars. So we didn't turn to that literature just because that's such a huge value. Um, and, and it's a different computational process to identify um, those statistical values. So that's often used in the the transportation sector, those statistical values, and maybe sometimes also in the environmental sector. Um, but we turn to the more more conservative values of the health technology assessment literature, which usually range between fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on the year, the reference year um, that you're looking at in terms of the studies. Um, and different countries use different rules of thumb for health technology. Um, um, sector evaluation um, in, in the NICE in the, U, in the UK, I think they're using about um, 80,000 pounds or something like that. In, in Europe, I've seen numbers that around 150,000 euros. So, so the range is quite broad in terms of um, between 50 to $200,000. So I figured the $100,000 would be somewhere in that middle range. We did do some sensitivity analysis around that value to use different values in using $50,000, $100,000 to get a sense of what the impact would be on our final point estimate. Great. Um, there's a, so again, a, a, just a couple of more detailed questions about some of the methodology. Um, about There's a question about what comprises the benefit cost savings of healthcare expenses in terms of the model? Okay, so um, we're just looking at um, the, the cost of, of healthcare services um, for persons with disabilities and, and thinking about um, the access to care too that causes more poor health outcomes. And so considering some of the, the savings that would be had if there was more accessible healthcare services for persons with disabilities. And so trying to bring down some of those um, expenditures on, on, on due to a lack of access and poor health outcomes for persons with disabilities. So, so there's some savings in terms of reduced expenditure because better health outcomes for persons with disabilities given better access. Okay. Um, you'd mentioned it, so there is one question, not from me, in the chat about the National Disability Insurance Program of uh, the NDIS in Australia. Um, you'd mentioned it briefly yourself in terms of the presentation. Yeah. So as you were describing the, the multitude of, of programs, the different safety net programs in, in Canada, um, did, have you done any work comparing alternatives of what would happen if Canada moved to a more national funding for all the um, for all the different types of initiatives yeah that, that that's a super great question um we know we haven't there's a short answer but um I, what, what I was framing the 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 analysis that we did here is being a very good starting point to consider those kinds of evaluations and and the key point I guess I was making is that there there is Obviously, there'd be some expenditures involved at, at, at some level, at the federal level, maybe provincial level as well, to provide some of those types of schemes. But there'd be lots of savings as well. So the comprehensiveness of our analysis allows one to compute the costs and the benefits in a very comprehensive way. Um, the, the, for those of you who don't know, the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia is sort of like a backpack model where you have access to um, a certain amount of funding each year that you can take with you for, for in different employment opportunities, in different um, social areas that you need some support. So it, it stays with the person. So it's very portable that way. And that scheme was introduced a few years ago in Australia. Um, and it's working very well, it seems, and there's lots of benefits because a person could then um, identify the kinds of support needs they need in different kinds of contexts in a particular employment opportunity and have the resources available to them to, to fund the, those needs. And then they can carry that with them to another employment opportunity. It's not exclusively for employment, that disability insurance scheme, but it is one area that it can be used. Um, and it's a 
federal level initiative in Australia. And, and one would think, okay, there's some costs involved in developing that kind of program and administering that kind of program and providing those resources, but there's lots of benefits that would be realized in terms of increased earnings of persons with disabilities, as I showed on that one slide, the, the benefits to, to the federal and provincial level jurisdictions in terms of increased tax revenue from both income tax and, and sales tax when people have more earnings at higher levels of consumption. So there's lots of gains that could be built into this analysis as well with, with the, the kind of framing and computations we did with in this study that would lend itself very well to a cost benefit analysis of, of that kind of a scheme. So certainly something we would consider doing in terms of evaluating this study over a certain time period in the future. So it's a prospective kind of analysis that we would do. And this, the computations that we've done in this study and in other studies have been used for that kind of purpose. So it's really flexible that way. I'm just giving it a, a use scenario where I think there'd be great value in doing that type of analysis. Great. Um, in terms of the, uh, the impacts, was there consideration in your models around the um, the impacts that, that might occur in terms of um, uh, in terms of with, if people with disabilities are more able to access the labour market that some of their caregivers who are of usually predominantly women uh, in terms of enabling them to get back to, to work as well um, I guess did the did the benefits also in, incorporate those wider benefits that might occur yeah yeah and that's some of the spillover effects but we had a, a module that's about caregiving in our framework, our 14 domains, one of them was about caregiving. And the, the key gains there would be, as you pointed out, Peter, whoever asked that question, was about um, um, reduced caregiving needs. So um, it would be um, reduced, um, improved quality of life, less stress related to caregiving, but also increased opportunities for those people to be actively engaged in the labor market and other social roles as well. So there's a quality of life gain for those people and also an earnings gain for those people, which we computed in that module of caregiving. So those would be the key, two key areas that would be gained for, for persons who are caregivers in quality of life and opportunities to be more actively engaged in other social roles, but particularly employment opportunities. I, yes, unfortunately, I can't take credit for the good questions. They're the ones that come through the chat. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, thanks for that question. <laughs> there's another question just around the so commenting on how impressive the, the methodology is and the, the, how compelling the results are. And I'm wondering if it's possible to apply the methodology so that you could look at the specific costs or, or benefits of inclusion within particular, say, industry sectors or among specific types of employers. Um, would the methodology lend itself to sort of a, a comparison across uh, industry groups as to which industries might gain the most? Yeah, yeah, well, th that's a very good question. Um, uh, certainly at the front end, I would say yes, sir. Obviously, when you're using the, the, the data we've the, the, and the methodology we've developed, there would need to be some adjustments, but certainly because of our input data coming from the CSD can be stratified by age group, sex, gender, and other social demographic characteristics of relevance. You could look at a subset of that population, look at their current employment situation, and think about a counterfactual scenario where they're more actively engaged in, in, in certain labor market activities. You could do it by sector, you could do it by demographic group to, to do a kind of drill down on a specific subset of that population to get a sense of the, the increase in the earnings that they would have if they were leveled up up to the same uh, employment opportunities of able-bodied persons. But also some of our work in, in terms of the sector specific stuff was looking at multiplier effects in terms of um, you know, increased um, you know, opportunities for, for, for persons without disabilities to be more productive as well. Because obviously when, when things are more accessible in terms of labor market opportunities, there's gains also for, for able-bodied persons. So we had a 1% productivity factor that we added into to the gains for, for the broader labor market in terms of increased productivity when technologies that they're using, when you know workspaces, everything is more accessible for a variety of people who may not necessarily identify as persons with disabilities, their productivity increases as well. So we accounted for that with a 1% productivity increase across the, all, the entire labor market. And you can do that by the sector as well. And then there is also the spillover effects that we use as a multiplier effect. That could be drilled down, I think, into looking at you know, increased sales uh, or revenue in particular sectors. We looked at tourism as, as, as one of those sectors, but we did not do a specific look at other sectors. So tourism would have increased 
opportunities for, for persons with disabilities to participate in various um, tribal opportunities and tourism type opportunities. And so that there'd be a growth in that sector. And we could do similar things, I guess, with other sectors to see the growth potential that would be realized when when both more people are working in it, but also those industries having more output and productivity because of a larger revenues from, from consumers who are purchasing those goods and services. So certainly warranting a consideration of drilling down into other sectors beyond just the tourism sector. Okay, so the next question is is just around, so I guess in terms of estimating the cost, I mean, we could flip these and say these would be the benefits if, if society was inclusive. Are there plans to look at um, ways or interventions that might be able to address some of these barriers, so to identify particular things that might have a very good cost benefit outcome in terms of inclusiveness um, down the track. Is that something you've done or that you plan to do? Uh, in the future? Um, yeah, and, and that's a huge undertaking with many people and, and needing to be involved in that capacity, identifying promising practices that could be scaled up across a you know, a particular sector or industry when we're talking about employment opportunities. That is something we'll be doing, obviously, in, in our um, social innovation laboratory, looking at, in, you know, doing environmental scans of promising practices internationally or even within the Canadian context and thinking about could we generalize this to other contexts and scale them up across across a sector or across industries. Um, and then obviously doing the, the cost benefit scenarios as well as other evaluations to, to better understand the potential gains to be realized through those initiatives. And then ongoing monitoring and evaluation is, is obviously really critical. You want to make sure that we are making the progress we thought we would have with some of these initiatives and so um, it would be something that you want to be do doing on a regular basis is monitoring evaluate monitoring and evaluating initiatives and their progress over time much like um, what I described with the EU OSHA study that we did which is being used to monitor and evaluate at the country level progress in reducing the the economic burden of work injuries and illness by implementing safe, safe practices, best practices on how to reduce um, harmful exposures in the workplace. And that's used for that purpose in Europe now. Um, and we could do the same thing with this kind of study at the country level, or we could drill down on specific sectors, but also then at the micro level doing cost benefits of specific initiatives to, on a prospective basis to understand you know, the merits of implementing them. And also then once you implement them on a kind of retrospective basis, are we actually making the progress we thought we would by continuing to monitor and evaluate using these types of um, analytic frameworks to, to assess the progress we're making over time? Um, so the next question is around different types of, of disabilities. So is, again, could the, could the method be used to understand the, the potential benefits and costs and if they differ across different types of disabilities, for example, physical versus intellectual versus developmental disabilities. Um, is that type of work or, or could that type of work be done or, or yeah. do you plan to do it? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And most definitely it'll be important to drill down on um, subsets of the population. Some groups are much more marginalized than others for a variety of reasons. Some of the challenges and barriers they face may have been dip more difficult for um, different actors in the systems to identify promising ways to break down those barriers or just skilling them up to how to do it well. I think so we definitely would want to drill down on specific subpopulations, particularly looking at those who are most marginalized, you know, certain types of persons with certain types of disabilities who may be more marginalized because of um, the challenges they face, maybe people with sight loss or dual sensory loss, those populations. I'm actually doing a study for CNIB that's looking at um, dual sensory loss, persons with sight loss and hearing loss, as well as the broader sight loss population. Um, they are particularly marginalized in terms of labor market opportunities to get a, a sense of how, how um, that population is doing currently versus the potential that they could have to be remarkably accessible and inclusive in labor markets for that subpopulation. So yeah, that would definitely be something you want to do. And the CSD can lend itself for, for the input data for that because it identifies persons with different types of disabilities to, to, to do some um, demographic analysis of certain subpopulations by type of disability, by age group, by geography, by sex, you know, certainly one drill down. So the distributional issues are really important to consider. We obviously want to tackle the one people who are most marginalized and find ways to, to, to address some of the barriers that they face. Okay, there's a just a, a note in the in the chat box um, for those who are interested in the, the NDIS in Australia, there is a paper 
on the um, called Moving Forward on the website everycanadiancounts.com. No endorsement, no endorsement from the Institute for Work and Health, uh, but just to say that for those who are interested in reading more about it, um, they can check out um, the website everycanadiancounts.com and look for the report moving forward. Um, in terms of those who are interested in the presentation as well, just to let people know that there is a copy of the presentation will be made available as a PDF with the recording and because you've registered for the presentation, you will get that um, recording and you'll get a notification when that's up on our website, usually within the, the next week. Um, a question now, Emil, just around, so some of the work or the work today has been talking a little bit about the workplace and, and accessibility in the workplace. Um, a question around the investigations on uh, ac accessibility issues when it comes to post-secondary education. And so in, in order for people who are living with disabilities to achieve their potential, often they need to access post-secondary education. And has there been any work trying to understand how those barriers also play a role in terms of access to the labour market? Yeah, um, that, that's a really good area that we definitely need to explore further. We did, as you probably noticed in our framework, we didn't have a separate module of computations for, for educational um, pursuits. Um, in our levelling up in the labour market, um, the underlying assumption is clearly that the skill sets of persons with disabilities are, are, are comparable to persons without disabilities. And so we could consider leveling them up to, to in the ideal scenario to that of able-bodied persons. But the implicit uh, uh, um, assumption there is also that their educational attainment is comparable. And that may not always be the case. So certainly there will be some work needed to drill down a little bit more on educational pursuits and the disparities that, that exist for persons with disabilities compared to able-bodied persons in terms of their opportunities for educational attainment in post-secondary education and understanding how that scenario can play out in terms of a more inclusive and accessible educational opportunities and, and understanding the, the gap that exists currently and the potential to be realized with, with leveling them up in, in educational attainment kind of thing. We didn't drill down on that. Some of that is, is, is just implicit, as I mentioned, in the labor market um, leveling up, but certainly it's something that would need to be delved into a little, little bit more detail to get a sense of where there are gaps in, in opportunities for persons with disabilities in different types of educational sectors um, and opportunities to, to reach their full potential in terms of, of, of training abilities more broadly, probably beyond even just the educational sector, but broader training opportunities and, and getting a sense of, of where there's room for improvement through promising practices or when we might try out and evaluate in terms of their potential in terms of their cost benefit analysis that's a whole world unto itself that we didn't delve into but certainly warrants a lot of attention okay i'm gonna try and and, and sort of group of we've got three questions here which are all sort of focused on costs for employers around um I guess, attitudes uh, and behavioural barriers uh, from employers' perspectives in terms of uh, employing people with disabilities and making workplaces more accessible um, in, in terms of helping them try to understand what the costs are for them versus what the potential benefits are. Um, wondering if you could explain in terms of some of the, the work that IDEA will be doing just around trying to, to reformulate the approach around mm. uh, how employers or I guess the cost for employers or the benefits for employers in terms of um, making workplaces more accessible uh, for people with disabilities. Okay, okay. That, that, that's a really important area that warrants a lot of, of, of attention in terms of better understanding some of the barriers. I think a lot of them may just be social stigma, um, fear of the unknown. And um, when we look at the literature, the cost of accommodating persons with disabilities in a lot of cases is nominal and, and it's more about knowledge and ability of how to um, do it well kind of thing. That's what we describe it as demand side capacity where we're skilling up employers on, on understanding how to do it well. Certainly we want to create a new normal that um, inclusive design in, in the employment settings creates opportunities for persons with disabilities but also for persons without disabilities and it has a, a many cases a win-win for both employers and for persons with disabilities and the larger labor market and population overall in, in the Canadian context. So certainly um, better understanding the different contexts in which employers struggle, whether it's about stigma, understanding of how to do it well, knowing what resources are out there to turn to to help them um, you know, develop 
programs and initiatives within their, their workplace that um, ensure that they are flexible and inclusive of the diversity of talent that's out there. So a lot of it is just knowledge and know-how creating a new normal. Um, it, we've learned just through this pandemic how we can actually do things differently, you know, with, with the obligations of working from home, um, that for at least some subsets of the um, persons with disabilities has been a, 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 a win for them and that, you know, people with mobility issues um, and have challenges getting to a, a workplace off, outside of their home, you know, are sometimes um, presented with barriers of, of not having a labor market opportunity because of the, the mobility issues that they might have. Now, working from home has opened up doors for, for persons with that who identify as disabled and have mobility issues. So, um, and, and we as a society have realized the potential through, through that um, um, unexpected, um, very adverse situation of, of a pandemic that has made us rethink how we work. And that's just an example. And certainly for some people who are at the front line, that, that has not worked for them because they're unable to continue working for front line type work, you know, in the service sector. Just let's say for maybe in restaurants or retail and things like that, it's been a super challenge. So there's a, a, a huge downsides as well, but certainly has opened our eyes to the fact that we can do things differently. So some of it is just understanding that there are different ways of doing things and, and being comfortable with, with trying new ways of operating, so creating that new normal. But certainly we'll need to develop some tools and resources to help employers um, um, be able to do a better job of being accessible and inclusive. Sometimes there might be some nominal costs involved in it, but certainly what we've seen from the literature is that it, in a lot of cases, there's not very much cost involved with accommodating persons. A lot of times it's just about stigma and attitudes and, and, and discomfort with the unknown, you know, concerns about, you know, what do I do if it doesn't work out? You know, can I dismiss a person with a disability or will I have a court case with a human rights tribunal, you know, that kind of fear of, of that unknown kind of thing. So that's, that can be overcome just by getting people more comfortable with realizing that there's a diversity of talent out there and that you can tap into. We're seeing labor market shortages in a lot of sectors and there's this huge talent pool of persons with disabilities that are largely untapped in many cases that, that are there to take up some of those positions. So and we're going to see more of that, I think, in the future of labor market shortages as the population ages and more people enter into retirement in Canadian society. We're seeing this across developed countries where the population is aging. So there's going to be a need and a demand to, to be better equipped at being inclusive and accessible as employers to tap into the diversity of talent that's out there. Um, but, but we'll be taking that on a case-by-case -case basis in our social innovation laboratory, you know, looking at certain sectors where there's opportunities, you know, what kinds of accommodation and skill sets, you know, both the service providers, the employers, and the public sector need to, to have available to um, be able to help support the uptake of, of the talent that's out there. So you know, that, that's a huge undertaking. It's not any one group or one person's um, efforts, but a, a collective effort across our society. But as, I, as we see from the numbers we've computed here, there's huge gains to be realized across various facets of, of our society. Um, both in the labor market and beyond that that are win-win for us as, as a society. So so if, if we kind of can embrace that that um, new normal to think about trying all the time to be inclusive and accessible and and, and, and um, um, accommodating of people's diverse needs and to be able to tap into their talent, you know, there, there's huge gains to be had. Um, and I think we have to do that if we want to continue to be a competitive society in terms of industries being competitive with the global competition, we need to tap into all the talent that we have available in our society. So um, it, it's, a, it's a long run project. There's no simple answer. We will all have to learn how to do things in a different way, you know, being more inclusive and accessible in, in all facets of our society. And, and at the end of the day, it will all win from the gains to be had and realized through those efforts. So there was a couple of questions that came in as you were going through that answer, Emil. One was just around if, if some of the work in the IDEA project will specifically focus on ways to accomplish that, that I guess, that real societal change in terms of um, the stigma and the, and the um, opinions that people have around uh, employing people with disabilities. So is, is some of the work in the IDEA lab specifically around ways to to reduce that stigma? 
Um, we, we are just trying to identify some of the front end projects. Um, we'll certainly look at um, sometimes sector specific barriers, whether they're about stigma or just knowledge and skills and know how. I think once we develop some tools and resources that'll help employers better understand how they can frame um, um, disability accommodation best practices within their workplace, you know, having more robust disability management systems, um, they'll realize the win-win. Um, and, and, and once we, we have um, a few, you know, leading employers showing the way forward, you know, who are opinion leaders who can show how there is lots to be gained from, from being more inclusive and accessible and, and accommodating people's um, needs to, to tap into their talent, it'll uh, it, hopefully it'll become the new normal. We're, we're looking at um, working specifically in the field in, in small scale trials to, to showcase how it works well and then try to scale them up across um, the, the country sector specific and across sectors as well. So it'll, it'll be um, a, a co-design process where we're working with our partners. We have a number of labor leaders, industry leaders, policy makers, service providers, community um, representatives that will, will all work together to, to, to identify the promising practices, um, translate them for particular context and um, take some small scale trials and then work on scaling them up across Canada. So, you know, once we start making inroads into to certain sectors, um, I'm sure there'll be lots of spillover effects where people real, will realize the, the benefits uh, of being inclusive employers and, and, and it'll be, catch on across the sector when there's some leaders who are showing the way forward. So it just you know, takes a, a cohesive group of, of, of um, partners who are, are really passionate about this issue and we've brought them together to, to help set the agenda and the way forward. Um, and, and, and it'll be, um, we have a six year time period to, to do this initiative. Our our commitment is to, to try to increase employment of persons with disabilities by 5%. So that's our target. And we won't be obviously doing it ourselves, but we'll be contributing as best we can to the larger initiatives that are happening across Canada. Okay, we've just got time for a couple more questions. Lots of uh, comments in the chat just around thanking you for, for the work and describing how impressive it is. I've got two more questions um, for you to answer. One is just around, so we've already talked a little bit about education sort of being an upstream barrier to employment for people with disabilities, but also more immediate barriers such as um, accessible transportation, access to accessible housing, um, accessible uh, attendant services. Will, and, the, and these also impact in terms of uh, how, the, how people with disabilities can access the workplace. Are these sort of within scope in terms of the work that, that IDEA will be doing around just trying to understand the flow on effects from trying to change these things that occur outside of the workplace but do impact accessibility to the workplace? Um, a very good question. Yeah, we, we are social innovation laboratories designed around what we describe as um, incubator hubs. We have three core ones. One is about workplace systems um, and partnerships, so what's actually happening in the work setting, you know, and the partnerships that are happening there. Well, another one is really focused on the wraparound supports um, that are really critical work, cannot work for, for people unless they have security of income, they have security of housing, that they have transportation. Um, um, available and accessible to them to get to work in many cases. So, so those wraparound things are really, really critical. So that's a, that's the focus uh, uh, of another incubator hub as well. And then the third core one is about um, transitions to work and, and career development. So whether it's school to work or transitioning from being out of the labor market and into the labor market and helping facilitate those transitions and also career advancement once you're in work and, and, and looking to advance your career over time as you invest in your, your, your training and your and, and your talent is being tapped into by a, an organization or, or in a sector and then you're you're getting more advanced in your in your skill sets, you know, helping facilitate employers to to play an active role in mentorship and advancement of persons with disabilities in different labor market opportunities. So so the the, the core hub. So a, a cross cutting hub we have is on 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 inclusive design and beyond the built environment, but it includes um, transportation as well. We have um, one of our partners is based in SUNY Buffalo. It's a, it's a group that focuses on transportation. Um, they're, they're, they're a group of architects and designers that have been active in the US space for 
uh, about 30 years now at SUNY Buffalo and have a really great workshop focusing a lot on the built environment, in particular their, one of their expertise is on transportation. So that'll be part, that, that one of the people from, from that research center is uh, the, the co-lead of um, Inclusive Design Hub, which is a cross-cutting hub. And then another cross-cutting hub is on new technologies. So, so disruptive technology, we call it, and how the future of work will be changing due to new technology. So three core hubs and then three cross-cutting hubs. So definitely transportation is a critical one. We hear that all the time. Just the struggles of trying to get to work often creates barriers to employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. So that's a really key part of it. And all of the wraparound supports too, as I mentioned, work is just feasible once you have security of your life or you know, everything outside of work, whether it's shelter and housing and food security and income security, all really critical components. That work is a luxury when you don't have the essential needs of your life um, met. Okay, in our last minute, Emil, I've got one more question and I need a little bit of time to be able to introduce next uh, next month's speaker series as well. Could you just tell us briefly, um, are there aspects of the methodology that you've used that you feel like need to be changed or you could critique or you might modify if you were to replicate this work into, in the future? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, there's always room for improvement for sure. Even though our work, I'm very, Pleased and proud of the work we've done, and we've we, we opened up new terrain that nobody has taken this work this far. So certainly there was a lot of um, struggles we had in terms of just having good data for certain um, um, computations. So just developing more data resources, we, we had a rich source of data from Statistics Canada and other sources that were invaluable for doing this. But there are certain areas that we just didn't have good data, like children with disabilities. We have a module about children with disabilities. We had to use data from 2006 because there's no recent data on on the experiences of children with disabilities in, in recent data sources. So there's lots of data development that needs to be done, but also methodological development. When we drill down on certain modules. Or, or domains that we have. Certainly, there's a lot of fine tuning thinking uh, about how to do a better job of this. It's, it's obviously research is an iterative process of always trying to improve on, 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 what, on what you're doing and that it better reflects people's preferences and values as well. So, I think a lot of um, um, interviewing with um, um, persons with lived experience and others who work in this space would help inform how we frame and, 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 and um, develop the. the the conceptual frameworks within each of the modules. We did a lot of that ourselves, but I certainly think there's lots more work to be done to, to fine tune those and develop more detail in some of the, the modules as we talked about earlier about the educational component. That is not explicitly visible in our framework and certainly requires a, a lot of attention to, to develop the framework to focus exclusively on educational opportunities for persons with disabilities and how that compares to able-bodied person, what the barriers are, and to frame the cost benefit and the economic burden that are currently experienced and the potential that would be realized in those areas. So there's lots of drill down that needs work. Certainly there, there's, it says there, this is a work in progress and it will continue to so. Okay, thank you very much, Emil. So that's the end of the questions. For, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for those, uh, I will just briefly mention our next speaker series presentation will be on March 8th. Um, the, Dr. Nancy Carnide will be presenting on cannabis use and the risk of workplace injury, findings from a longitudinal study of Canadian workers. Um, so for those who are interested in joining us for that speaker series presentation, Sabrina has just put the link in the chat where you can register for that presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Emil, for the presentation and for answering so many questions. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed it and we'll see you all again next time. Thanks a lot. Thank see you everyone. Bye-bye.